You know, uh, I remember uh, Frank telling me that the, the typical Baptist sermon was what, three points in an illustration? Yes, three uh, points in a story. Three points in a story. Three points in a story. And um, I think you know that I don't go by that, you know? But I do. <laughs> three points in a story. Um, so like 50 years ago, I think now, uh, Marshall McLuhan, a uh, famous media specialist, said that the medium is the message. I don't know if you've ever heard that line before, a very famous line. And by that he meant that the, the medium by which we transmit a, a, a message has as much contributing to the content as the message itself, that you can't separate the two. And when I look at Jesus, I see Jesus living the medium of his message. He is the medium of his message. And that is so important to me. And so as I look at spiritual life, it's, it's a circular journey. You know, you start, you take a journey, you go through the far country, and you come back again where you started. And like T.S. Eliot said, you know the place for the first time. And the messages I'd like to have kind of be that journey to, to take that, that, that step. And so, you know, I'll start typically out somewhere in left field, right? And then it comes around, and, and I know how that sometimes that uh, messes with your heads. But uh, if it messes with your heads, imagine what it does to mine. Because when I'm prepping this thing, I'm all over the place. I'm telling you, you know, God bless the internet, but it takes me to some far off places sometimes. You know, you start here, you take that link and this link, and you know, four links later, you're at Kevin Bacon, right? That's the way it works, or is that six links? I don't know. But I was doing some, uh, when I was doing some prep, uh, I ended up thinking about how one of the goals of spirituality is sort of bring all the disparate parts of our life into one place, under one roof. And I, then I thought, of course, of Albert Einstein and the grand unified field theory, wouldn't you? <laughs> but here's the thing. So I, I, I was checking that out, and I came across a passage that I want to read to you about fields. And these fields in physics would be the gravitational field, the electromagnetic field, and the strong and weak um, you know, nuclear fields and so on and so forth. But Einstein was the first one, and there have been many others. Actually, he was one of the first who wanted to bring all of those fields into one statement. And so I read this, and it was kind of a wake-up call for me. Just listen for a second. This is about fields. <laughs> Governed by a global event under the universal topology, an operational environment is initiated by the scalar fields of a rank zero tensor, a differential function of a complex variable in its domain at its zero derivative, where a scalar function is characterized as a signal magnitude with a variable component of the respective coordinate sets. Because a field is incepted or operated under either virtual or physical primacy of a Y plus or Y minus manifold, respectively and simultaneously, each point of the field is entangled with and appears as a conjunctive function of the scalar field in its opponent manifold. A field can be classified as a scalar field, vector field, or a tensor field according to whether the respected physical horizon is at a scope of scalar vector or tensor potentials, respectively. All right. Each word there is in English, and I have not the slightest clue, no matter how many times I read that, what that means. Now, sometimes I've, told, I've heard you tell me about either my writing uh, or about the message, that it's pretty dense, that you have to read it several times sometimes, and you just, you, uh, I lost you. And when I read this, I was really hoping that what I say is nothing like that. <laughs> I mean, I, and, but it was, it was kind of like, it's like, wow, you know, Try to be simple. Let's just try to be as clear and simple and short as we possibly can. And that's going to be what I'm going to try to do today. But you know me. Let's see, let's see what we can do. To me, it is so important for us to dig deeper. You know, not just skirt along the surface, but really dig deeper and see if we can unearth some things, some treasures that seem paradoxical maybe, that, that seem at first blush that they just Shouldn't be, can't be, but when you actually move into them, they're this liberating force in your life. Um, last Wednesday, we started, uh, well, we started the book of James a few Wednesdays ago, uh, but last Wednesday, we really dug into really the first few chapter, first few verses of James. And if you take a look at James 1, starting right at verse 2, this is where James says, Consider it all joy my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have, it per have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, 
lacking in nothing. Already, right off the bat, James is setting up a conflict for us. He's setting up a paradox for us. He's setting up cognitive dissonance, at least. Consider it all joy when everything starts falling apart. Consider it all joy when everything comes against us. You know, the, the epistles are, are really unique in Scripture because they're always answering a question. You know, it's like that Jeopardy game where you get the answer but not the question. What's the underlying question here for a statement like this? Why would James begin his whole treatise like this? Because the obvious question is, all his people in his flock are coming to him and saying, if we're following Jesus, if we're doing everything right, why is life so hard? And it was hard for them. We're talking about it in our study that the Jews were already under the oppressive boot of the Romans and had been for three generations by this time. But now that those Jews who have split off to follow Jesus are coming into their own, now they're being persecuted by their own people as well. The Jewish hierarchy is persecuting them. They're getting it from both barrels and as the, the unrest is ramping up to the first Jewish-Roman war at the end of the first century, it is getting tougher and tougher just to be a Jew living in Judea, let alone this double persecution that, that led to executions and confiscation of property, exile. If we're following Jesus, if we're doing everything right, why is life so hard? And what is he trying to tell them? He's saying if you, first of all, he's going to tell them, Life is hard, and it's not going to get any easier. Sorry, I'd like to tell you that. But if you can take that complaint, if you can take that attitude, that belief that this hardship is something that is a curse, this hardship is something that is a negative, that maybe it shows that God isn't pleased with us and turn it around and see it for what it really is, an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to find complete maturity, lacking in nothing, then everything is going to change in your life. We talked about the famous book by Scott Peck, uh, The Road Less Traveled, and the first line is, life is difficult. But as you read the paragraph, what he's telling us is, life is difficult. It will always be difficult. It won't be anything else. But as soon as you accept and make friends with the fact that life is difficult, then it's not difficult anymore. When you are encountering various trials and tribulations, what you believe about those is going to have everything to do with how you experience them. And if we can take those and turn it around, everything changes. James is trying to get us to manage our expectations. If our expectations are realistic, if our expectations are correct, if our expectations and our experience are one and the same, that's a good moment. As soon as there's some daylight between the two, that's all the space we need to be really miserable. And that's what James is trying to get us to understand. You know, last week, I've been try and for the last few weeks, I've been trying to encourage you to use Lent, to use this time of the year, this liturgical season, as sort of a boot camp, as sort of a, a training ground for yourself, a way for you to dive deeper, to institute on your own, your own daily regimen, spiritual discipline. We call them sacraments last week. For you to find a way to be able to move deeper. We talked about what would persuade you to do such a thing. And we had that one article from last week saying, you know, one way to get someone to be persuaded is to encourage their dreams. And that's absolutely true. The question is, what are your dreams? What are your goals for your spiritual life? What would be your goal if you were to dig in deeper, if you were to set yourself a disciplined structure and regimen for the next few weeks leading up to Easter, and hopefully in that space create a habit that lasted beyond Easter and just became a way of living life for you? But if you do all that, if you go through all that effort, why? What is it that you're hoping to achieve? Well, I'll tell you, after about 20 years of doing this, the answers that I hear to that question, what are your spiritual goals, always revolve around, you know, peace. I want to feel peace. I want to feel serenity. I don't want to be afraid anymore. All the things that stress me out and all the things, I want to feel those just fall away and just be centered, balanced. 
that pretty close? We can call it love. We can call it a lot of things. But that really is what we want. We want all of that stuff that's roiling around to just fall down, to just move down. You know, we want all that pain, confusion, all that loneliness and the sadness to stop. We want to feel secure and we want to feel at peace. But James is telling us that life is hard <laughs> and it's not going to stop being hard. So the question then becomes, is that expectation of peace as we're understanding it realistic in terms of the spiritual life and the spiritual discipline that we want to go through? Well, James was Jesus' brother, and the apple did not fall far from the tree. So James took over for Jesus after the crucifixion and led the Jerusalem following for 30 years until he was executed by stoning. What did Jesus say about the same sort of topic? Well, let's take a look. At John 14, verse 27, we're going to talk about peace. Jesus says, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That's in the NASB, the New American Standard. Take a look at the same phrase in the, um, the same verse in the CEV, which is the contemporary English version. I give you peace, the kind of peace that only I can give. It isn't like the peace that this world can give. So don't be worried. Don't be afraid. A little bit more conversation, a little bit more understanding. Jesus is giving peace. Why is he even saying this to his followers right now? This occurs in John at the Last Supper. He's getting ready to be crucified. He knows what's happening. He knows he's going to be leaving them, and he knows exactly how they're going to feel. They're going to feel abandoned. They're going to feel confused. They're going to feel blown to the wind. And he's trying to tell them something. I'm leaving something with you. I'm leaving this peace. And it's not going to be the way the world gives peace. How does the world give peace? The world gives peace temporarily. Doesn't it? The world gives peace as a function or a result of external circumstances. When there is an absence of conflict, we feel peaceful. That's the way the world gives peace. But James is saying that's not going to be so. Jesus is telling them that's not going to be so for you either. But I'm going to give you a peace that is going to endure. I'm going to give you a peace that will never leave you. That sounds pretty good so far. I think we're on track, right? But wait, there's more. Look at Matthew 10, 34. This is Jesus speaking again. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Uh-oh. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now what are we going to do with that? You know, just as a side, I, I love this. When you look at that part that is the quote there in all caps. The family members that are mentioned there, mother, father, son, daughter, and daughter-in-law. You know, that's a little strange to our ears, right? But those were the members of a Jew Judean household. You know, you didn't ever have a son-in-law in your home because the sons always stayed with their families. It was the daughters that came and lived with the family. So all there were were father, fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and daughters-in-law. It's those little details that just give us the clues and the cues how authentic this is. It's rooted right in the reality of their households. And Jesus is using this image to bring something home to his followers. I'm not going to bring peace but here's the catch, because what gives? He's bringing peace. He's not bringing peace. He needs to make up his mind, right? Aramaic, his native language, comes to our rescue, because even though it's the same word in English, it's two separate words in Aramaic. When Jesus says, I give you my peace, my peace I leave you, in Aramaic, it's salama or shlama. But in Hebrew, the one that we know is shalom. Shalom, peace, used as a greeting in Hebrew, hello and goodbye, just like aloha, because what shalom means is the greatest amount of health and wealth and prosperity and relationship and wholeness and connection. Everything that possibly can be good in life is what shalom means, shalom. This is the peace that Jesus is bringing. But when he says, I didn't come to bring peace, the word he uses is shainah, 
Shaina means calm or tranquility. You hear the difference of what's going on here? He didn't come to ensure us, to guarantee us calm and tranquility. I don't know about what your experience has been like. If you really have set out to do something different, as soon as you veer off the mainstream, what happens? You encounter resistance from just about everyone around you who's still in the mainstream. And the most resistance you're going to get is from the members of your own household, the people that are closest to you. Those are the ones that you're going to feel most keenly because they're the people that you rely on for connection. And as soon as that daylight opens up, if you're going to follow Jesus, this is a radical departure, a radical departure from the mainstream, a radical departure from everything we think we know about life, about society, about community, about faith, about spirituality. Jesus is testing and challenging all of that. And when we follow him, the division sets in. That was my experience. It was difficult. It was difficult for me to follow this voice that I knew was calling me, but at the same time was putting me at odds with my own faith community. I eventually had to resign my, my post there, my, my staff position there, and leave because I couldn't follow and not create factions, not create problems. You know? Jesus is telling us straight out that if you follow this path, it's going to be difficult. You're not going to find the calm. You're not going to find the tranquility. But... What I think Jesus is saying is something even a little bit more. I think what he's telling us also is that as long as we're looking for, as long as we're expecting Shaina, as long as we're expecting this calm, this tranquility, this kind of kumbaya moment as we move into uh, our spiritual discipline, if we're looking for that, we will never find shalom. We will never find this fullness. If we're looking for tranquility, we're not going to find that. And I know that sounds so counterintuitive. But in fact, I think that our ability to have shalom, to have this peace that never leaves us, this peace that comes from the inside out, this peace that incorporates the wholeness of everything, depends on our ability to accept not having shana, not having the tranquility and the calm in our lives that we're looking for. When I was just getting started in my journey, um, I should say, when I was getting started with my journey and I circled back to Christianity after almost 15 years away during my 20s, it was my early 30s, and I landed at this church here in South County. The first lunch that I had with the pastor of that church, we sat down and as we were talking, he finally looked at me and said, you know what, you know, you've got divine dissatisfaction. That's what he called it. Divine dissatisfaction is what's driving you. And I didn't exactly know what he meant by the divine part. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I knew exactly what he meant by the dissatisfaction part. As long as I could remember, I wasn't satisfied. I can remember in first grade going to Catholic school and lying in bed at night thinking about what the nuns had taught us in religion that morning. I was just like, how could that be? That doesn't make any sense to me. A little first grader, you know. But, and so it began, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And in all the years since, with all the work I did, I, you know, I went 12 years of Catholic school. I joined uh, the religious order out of high school that, that taught me in high school, and I kept trying and trying. And when Christianity just didn't, just didn't seem to fit the bill and fell flat, I tried music, I tried this, I, I tried everything. When I circled back to, to Christianity, it felt like coming home, but there was still that thing driving me, and this pastor put his finger on it. And I was wondering, divine dissatisfaction, did he really come up with that? That's, that's pretty amazing. And what did he mean by divine? Now, I suppose by divine he meant that at least I was still looking for truth. I was still looking for answers within spirituality, within religion. I mean, after all, I was sitting there talking to him, right? I was joining his church. I think deeper than that, he meant that there was a call that I was listening to, God's drawing of me to himself 
was what was creating this dissonance in me because I, I wasn't answering yet. I wasn't connected yet. And so that divine dissatisfaction related to the fact that that was God's call. I didn't see it that way at the time. I just wanted the hurting to stop. I just wanted to find Shina, even though I had no clue. That wasn't even the twinkle in my eye yet, Shina. But in terms of the Hebrew, but I wanted that. I wanted that. I remember finding out later that divine dissatisfaction is actually a quote from one of the most famous dancers of the 20th century. And I thought, do you really think Pastor Dick quoted a dancer? I don't know. He was more of a football quoter than a, than a dance quoter. But at, at any rate, it was Martha Graham, if you've ever heard of her, a famous dancer and choreographer of modern dance. And I want to read you the little bit that um, it's here in your inserts that was really a in a conversation between her and another dancer and choreographer na named Ag Agnes DeMille, who had just been hired to choreograph Oklahoma, which was one of the greatest musicals of the 20th century, over 2,000 performances. And it was noted to change the way that dance was used in American theater. And yet she was so unhappy with her work. She thought she had done better work before that had never been recognized or noticed, and now she's getting noticed and getting famous for this, and it just didn't make any sense. And they went and had a soda together, and they were sitting down, and finally Mar uh, Martha just looks her dead in the eyes, and she says, there is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It's not your business to determine how good it is or how it compares with other expression. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. You do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. No artist is ever pleased. There is no satisfaction, whatever, at any time. There is only a queer, divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. Wow. And you listen to that, and you think, okay, that's a little bit obsessive. Maybe even OCD, huh? And, you know, in certain contexts, yeah, it is. Artists are a little crazy, aren't they? And the better they are, the crazier they are. But she's also making a critical point here, one that we cannot miss. We don't move unless we're dissatisfied with where we are. You get that? Unless there is some kind of unrest that is driving us, we don't move. Everything that has ever been achieved, every spiritual discipline that has ever been engaged, is engaged because it begins with divine dissatisfaction. There is some place we need to be, some place we want to be. There is something that feels that it's missing in us, and it moves us forward. We can't help it. Jesus was impelled. The word ekvalo in Greek, impelled, that is not a gentle word. He was impelled into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Something, some deep dissatisfaction, some divine unrest, blessed unrest, caused him to leave home, to leave family, to leave everything he knew, and to go out and find what it was that was impelling him. He talks about the narrow gate, the constricted gate, the narrow way that leads to life, and few go by it. He's talking about this very thing. Those who are dissatisfied, those who are at unrest, are the ones who will negotiate that narrow gate, who will stick to that narrow way, that will find another path that will take them to where they are going, where they think they need to go, even if they don't know what that is. 30 years later, I'm on the other side of the desk. And I'm talking to you all. Sometimes one-on-one -on -one at lunch. We go have lunch and talk. 
and I'm seeing the divine dissatisfaction in you all as well. You're here. Something impelled you to be here. And the more that you've dug in, the greater that divine dissatisfaction. They're all different intensities. I see it in every person. In some of you, it is so driving that you have literally changed the course of your life in the years that I've known you, sometimes in the months that I've known you. It's an amazing thing to see. Others, it's kind of like the, uh, the parable of the four soils, right? Some of it falls on the good soil. Some of it falls on the rocks and the weeds and this and that. All those different layers and intensities of dissatisfaction and unrest play out in each life as to how driven they're going to be, how disciplined they're going to be, how soon they're going to be. And some people in the time that I know them, they, they turn and they go another direction, and that's fine. Maybe that dissatisfaction has shown them another path to take, not mine to judge. It's just mine to be here and to help for whatever period of time that I have in connection with a person. But I see that now in the same way that the pastor saw it in me. It's so interesting to have that turn around, all those different intensities. But again, what purpose is driving us? We feel the dissatisfaction. We feel the unrest. What is it that we hope to find? Is it simply to be satisfied, to end up completely at rest? You know, that's what I thought. That's what I thought I was going after. I thought all of this turmoil in my gut, in my spirit, everything that I had been experiencing for the decades that I had been alive, that was growing in intensity, I thought, finally, when I find the answer, if I could just find that answer, I was hoping it was going to be like a switch that I could flip, and all of that would just be in a puddle on the floor, and I could finally just be at rest. That's what I thought was going to happen. I thought I could then just stay put, just follow the law, follow the rules that the church was laying down, and wait for heaven. And, of course, I imagine heaven as the same sort of thing, but, you know, to the nth degree, that heaven was just going to be the place of complete, you know, end of desire, extinguishment of longing, that everything was just going to be so. Everything was going to be perfect. I could just rest on that cloud, you know? And so many of us imagine heaven just that way. It's the end of all pain. It's the end of all suffering. It's the end of all movement, really. If everything is perfect, why would you move off of that spot? Where would you go? <laughs> you know? But is this really what the scripture tells us? Is this really what Jesus tells us? You know? Jesus told us straight out there were things that he didn't know that only the Father knew. He said he didn't even know some of the things that he did. It was just the Spirit blowing through him that did them through him. He didn't understand it. He's pointing to faith not as a certainty, but faith as mystery. Still things in Father that he couldn't get, that he didn't understand. All he had to do was just, just to keep act, acting. He called Spirit the wind. He said it's like a wind that blows through. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going to. But here, in the breeze... You know what direction it's blowing, and you can follow that. But you don't know. See, I thought faith as a certainty was going to give me the answer that would be my satisfaction, that would finally bring me to rest. But Jesus is telling something very different. And he's saying, hey, as you walk down this path that you don't even know where you're going, it's also going to bring division and difficulties and a narrow, constricted gate in a way that you're going to have to somehow negotiate. And then everything that we have, the few little details we have about heaven, it talks about movement. Isn't there movement in heaven? Heavenly bodies are moving around. They're coming to earth. They're going back up to heaven. Paul talks about us. If we can understand enough about what is going on in our spiritual journeys here on earth, then we get to rule and reign in heaven. Well, who the heck are we ruling and reigning over? Isn't there someone then who still needs direction? who still needs guidance, still needs a hand at the small of the back, still needs correction. If there is movement of any kind, it's because the mover felt the need or the desire 
to be somewhere else. As soon as there is that desire, there is the dissatisfaction, the unrest as well. Heaven is like that. All I can tell you is the clues that I have, and all I can tell you is that Jesus portrays his Father as this infinite, incomprehensible mystery. If God really is infinite, if God really is all that, then as long as we desire, we are always going to be free-falling into the center of that bottomless God. There is no landing point. There is no final view of God that finishes it all off. There is always another and another and another. And what is it in us that will not settle for anything less than the next view and the one after that and the one after that? Like an obsessive dancer or artist or choreographer or anything who every time they finish a project know that there's another project from which they can learn from the previous project and make it better and make it better than that. It's like that. Life is defined by movement. Where we see movement, we understand that's life. Every movie you see where someone looks dead and the slightest movement tells you, oh, there's still hope, they're still alive, and everything changes, right? Life is movement. Movement is life. If there's no movement, there's no life. Spirit is always defined as movement. The word ruha in Aramaic, ruach in, in Hebrew, means breath and wind and spirit all at the same time, defined as something that never stops moving. Wind is only wind if it's moving. Breath is only alive if it's moving, and spirit is only spirit if it's moving. Jesus said to the women who came to find him on Easter morning, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for something that is always in motion in a place of stasis, in a place where nothing moves? Motion is our clue that maybe heaven isn't what we think it is because it's still an adventure. It's still a mystery. There's still something around every corner that keeps us guessing and interested and alive. That, to me, is the most exciting thing. What are our expectations about our spiritual journey? If we think that it is going to be to come to complete rest, we're going to be disappointed, and it may deflect us distract us, deter us from continuing on because we're expecting something different. But if we can take what James and Jesus are telling us here and turn that around and realize that each difficulty, each new thing that we encounter is growing us further into the mystery. And if we can hang on to that blessed unrest, it will continue to propel us into the center of God's heart. I wrote a little piece on this, and I just wanted to finish with this today. Spiritual growth doesn't displace our blessed unrest. It allows us to live untroubled and unafraid in the midst of the unrest. For dancers and any of us who just want to walk across a room in God's presence, what looks effortless on stage is really a sacred tension between muscle and awareness that keeps us balanced and engaged and more alive. Jesus is telling us that to follow his way is to live each moment like a dancer. In full awareness and engagement, every spiritual muscle finely tuned and firing, bringing everything we are to everything that is, to identify with everything that is, and finally realize that who we are can't be separated from everything around us because our Father is always there in the center of it all. Years of practice can make it automatic, but only the tension and unrest make this possible. There is a moment that we realize that though truth never changes, it is still inexhaustible. And that is the moment we realize we will never reach the end of it as long as we, re we remain at least a little bit dissatisfied. But the moment we realize our dissatisfaction is divine, 
that our unrest is blessed, always a call to deeper connection, it becomes peaceful at the same time. It becomes the prayer of a peaceful life lived in the midst of blessed unrest. I pray that you have divine dissatisfaction, that you have blessed unrest, and that you celebrate that and you let it take you on the journey that never ends and find deeper and deeper connection with your God. Let's pray. Father, often I pray, take us wherever you'd like us to go. And I'd like to pray that again this morning. Take us beyond what we think we understand, Father. Take us beyond what feels comfortable and familiar. Give us courage. Allow us to exercise our courage to be able to follow a path that does veer off from the people around us. To accept whatever that entails, to find new ways to connect with, no peop with new people who are connectable, and to find that no matter where we end up in you, it is the perfect place to be. This Lent, help us to use this time wisely, Father. Help us to use this time as an excuse to dig deeper, to find a structure that we can be disciplined to that will take us again wherever you want us to go, which is always deeper into you. Father, thank you for everything that you do for us every moment. Thank you for the love that you never stop showering on us and never let us forget that we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.